Ali and I'm with Greenpeace. We are streaming from Oslo, Norway, where we are in the middle of the uh, historic court case against the Norwegian government. Uh, we are taking the Norwegian government to court because we think that they are violating their own constitution by allowing further oil drilling in the Arctic. I will soon be joined by Michelle, our attorney, who will explain to us what is going on in the courtroom right now, and Aslak Björn, a board member of the Sami youth organization, Noor, and he will uh, explain to us a little bit how uh, the Norwegian government's decision may affect the Sami community. We'll be back shortly, don't go anywhere, um, but while we wait, you can do two things. Uh, you can uh, type a question in the comments to any of our guests or any questions you might have related to this case. And please, if you haven't yet done so, add your name to the growing body of ed evidence against Arctic oil drilling. But don't go anywhere. See you soon. Thanks for being with us tonight. Um, shortly after having signed the important climate agreement, agreement in Paris, the Norwegian government handed out new oil drilling licenses for new areas in the Arctic for the first time in 20 years. This doesn't make sense to most of us, but that is not the only reason why we are in Oslo right now. Uh, Greenpeace, together with Nature and Youth and Grandparents Climate Campaign, have taken the Norwegian government to court. We believe that they are violent, violating the laws of their own constitution by allowing this new oil drilling in the Arctic. Nearly half a million people have signed their names in support of this court case, adding their names to a growing body of evidence against Arctic oil drilling. There's still time to sign. We still have about 24 hours to do this, so please do it. If you haven't, you'll find the link in the Facebook post. Shortly, I will be joined by Ajlak Björn uh, from the Sami youth organization, NOR. Uh, he will talk to us a little bit about how the government's decision can affect the Sami community. But first, I would like to talk a little bit to Michelle, our attorney. Welcome. Hi. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what is actually going on in the courtroom right now? Sure. Thank you for having me and uh, thank you all at home for taking the time and taking an interest in these issues. Um, as you correctly pointed out, we are taking the Norwegian government to court. Um, we are doing so because they opened up a new area for drilling for oil and gas in the Arctic. And uh, we are using both constitutional law and international law um, to make our case, to prove our case. Today was actually, um, it is the halfway point. It is now the turn of the state to uh, present their arguments and their defense. Uh, we had the opportunity the whole last week to present our witnesses and our, our arguments on the law. Um, so tomorrow as well, the state will uh, continue the presentation of their defense. So we're almost there. So maybe we should take it even one step further back. Sure, uh, sure. Many of us are not native English speakers. Yes. Uh, what is the constitution exactly? <laughs> and this uh, yeah. paragraph 112 sure. that we keep talking about. This is, a, this is an excellent question because, um, well, the constitution in most legal systems is the highest law in the land. So all government action, uh, legislation, regulations, the decisions 
that the administrative bodies take, they must be in conformity with the provisions of the Constitution. So the Constitution kind of is like the supreme law of the land, and that is the case also in Norway. Article 112, which is the heart of our legal case, grants everyone the right to a healthy environment, and it also safeguards these rights for future generations. Furthermore, it places on the Norwegian government a duty to uphold these rights. So we're actually invoking the highest law of the land in this legal case. Yeah. So the constitution is like the law above other laws. It is the say. mother of all laws, if yeah. you will. Yeah. So um, why do you think that the rest of the world should care about what goes on in a Norwegian courtroom? There are several, there are several reasons, actually, that um, the Norwegian government, uh, the Norwegian government's actions in the Arctic matter uh, for the rest of the world, and why this case is relevant also for other jurisdictions. I would start by saying that uh, the actions of the Norwegian government in opening up this new area uh, in the Arctic are actually placing uh, Arctic ice under threat. Uh, Arctic ice, as you know, has a fundamental uh, role in regulating the Earth's temperature. So by putting Arctic ice uh, in such a situation that is going to uh, further exacerbate the melting of the Arctic ice, then you're also further exacerbating the effects of climate change, which, as you know, are already affecting uh, people all over the world. Uh, so on the facts is actually relevant for everybody else. Uh, now, on the law, it's also relevant. We have about 90 constitutions around the world that have the right to a healthy environment also as a constitution, uh, constitutionally protected right. And so what happens in the Norwegian courtroom, how the judge looks at the protections of this article can also have other repercussions in other uh, lo domestic legal systems. At the same time, we were just talking about the Paris Agreement. We had 197 countries that signed it. So how the judge here looks at the Paris Agreement, at the commitments that countries have made, especially developed nations, so the commitment, for example, to take the lead in combating climate change, in having their efforts reflect the highest possible ambitions, all these things, all these commitments, what is the strength of these obligations, how they're seen in a Norwegian courtroom, will have repercussions in the rest of the world. Because we're seeing uh, this happening in other parts of the world as well, that people are, are starting to use the courts. That's quite right, yes. We, we are actually part, I think that this case is part of a growing wave of climate change litigation around the world. So we've had cases in New Zealand, South Africa, uh, Peru, um, Philippines. We, in the Philippines, for example, you have the Human Rights Commission that is investigating 47 fossil fuel companies for their role in causing climate change that has infringed on the human rights of the Filipino people. Mm -hmm. In the United States, you have 21 youth plaintiffs that have sued the Trump government uh, for failing to take sufficient action on climate change. We have senior women in Switzerland. We also have the very big win in the Urgenda case in the Netherlands, where the Dutch court in The Hague actually found that uh, the Dutch government had committed a tort, also a civil wrong against the Dutch people by failing to sufficiently reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So you're seeing these cases popping up all over the world uh, because at the end of the day, if the governments fail to act on the science, then we actually have to take, uh, take a stand, uh, civil society, uh, regular people, and go to the courts and ask the courts to ask the government to uphold our rights. You mentioned uh, fossil fuel companies here. Yes. I see that we have a question. Um, I heard that the Norwegian oil fund is getting out of oil and gas. What is that about? Sure, that's actually um, it was, it's the bank that manages the fund, the biggest oil fund in the world, last week announced that they, that they uh, recommend to divest from, uh, from, from oil investment, basically. And um, what this signals to the court is that our socioeconomic experts, their analysis is right. And let me take a step back and tell you a little bit about that. Because the, the socioeconomic experts, the testimony that they gave, the report that they wrote, um, it that shows- last week? In, in this is last week, yeah. 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 So the, this actually shows that uh, they were able to show that the government failed to take into account uh, the vulnerability, the economic risk of the changing price in oil. And they also showed that the government overstated the benefits from opening up this new area for drilling for oil. And at the same time, they ignored a substantial part of the risks, one of them being, as I said uh, just now, 
uh, the fluctuating and uncertainty of the oil price. And now having the oil fund, uh, the bank that manages the oil fund, come out and say, hey, actually, there's too much risk in oil, it just further proves our case. So it's actually quite significant, and that's an that's a interesting question that you got. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, keep questions coming. If you have them, just post them in the comments, and I'll try to catch, and catch them as we go. Um, so nearly half a million people, we're hoping to get to half a million, yes. people have signed um, as, uh, or added their names to this growing body of evidence against uh, Arctic oil. What does that mean to have these names from people all around the world in, in practice? So it's, it's actually quite amazing. First, let me just comment on the number of people. Uh, the last time that uh, we had a Facebook Live, it was 40,000 less than this number or something. I think we're very close to half a million signatures uh, and people just keep on adding their names and giving their support. And this is not just adding your name to, to any other petition or something. This is actually your name will be used as part of, uh, of the record, as part of our body of evidence to prove our case. And the point that is helping us prove is that there is a global opposition against Arctic oil. So it does strengthen our case to have people sign up and sign their name, and it will be submitted in court. And we have, I believe, only one more day, only 24 hours more. So if you were doubting, uh, please uh, sign up. And, and if you have a question, just, just let us know, and we'll, we'll make sure to address it. Ask questions, sign your name, share this with your friends so we can get some more signatures. That would be fantastic. Um, thank you so much, Michelle, uh, for answering these questions. Yeah. Um, I would also, we would also like to show a brand new video um, that we call People's Witness Statement. Uh, it's uh, people around the world from Cameroon, Romania, Denmark, Indonesia have come together and uh, created this beautiful piece against Ar Arctic oil drilling. Uh, so um, have a look. Here we go. trying to drill the Arctic. Look around you. We are here on a heating globe. Oil companies do not own the planet. I hope you who are trying to drill the Arctic think of your children, grandchildren, fighting over clean water, suffering from starvation and crop failures. Look, Look around, around you. We are here where the ice is melting. We can see weather patterns changing every year. Barely a month goes by without some record of other being broken. Rainfall. When temperatures. Look around you. We are here where waters get warmer. People lose their homes. Friends. Families. You. Who are trying to drill the Arctic. Look, Look around, around you. you. Look around you. Look around you. For your grandchildren. For yourselves. Please. We are here. That was the People's Witness Statement. Uh, thank you for watching. Don't forget that you still have 24 hours to add your name to the growing body of evidence against Arctic oil drilling. With me now, I have Ajlak Björn, um, board member of the Sami Youth uh, Organization called uh, NOR. NOR, yeah, real good pronunciation. <laughs> thank you. Um, what is your relationship with the Arctic environment? Well, first and foremost, I uh, grew up in the Arctic environment uh, in a little town called Pasvik, far north in Norway. Um, so I grew up in a forest. <laughs> and my parents actually were uh, dog mushers or like breeding uh, sled dogs. Sled dogs, ah, okay. So yeah. we're a lot out in uh, the nature from an early age. Then I got really into environmentalism and nature conservation in uh, my teen years, and I've been a member and working in uh, Nature and Youth, the co-plaintiff in the court case, for uh, 10 years now. <laughs> oh, wow. 
So, what effects does uh, climate change have on the Sami community, in in particular? Yeah. So the Sami community is, or the Sami people, is the indigenous people of uh, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia, living in the far north in the Arctic environment. Um, and traditional Sami li livelihood is real dependent on uh, on nature and on an uh, understanding of nature and predictable weather and climate, uh, which makes sense when you live off of things as hunting, uh, harvesting resources as berries and firewood, uh, and also reindeer herding. So small changes in the climate might have a big impact on traditional livelihoods. For example, for the reindeer herders, and the reindeer herding is one of like the big Sami cultural identical manifestations. Um, cold weather, lots of snow, no problem for the reindeer. They'll get through the snow and get the moss they need to eat. Uh, but with warmer winters, you have the problem that you get cold weather, but then it turns warm, it might rain, and you get an ice cover over the ground, which the reindeer can't penetrate with, the, with their feet and horns. Um, making it really hard for reindeer herders to get enough food for the reindeer. Another problem is how increasing temperatures affect the ecosystems. Um, everyone loves butterflies, but the caterpillars of the butterflies actually are <laughs> really hungry, as some know from a children's book. Um, <laughs> the problem now is that due to warm winters, they are, going, they are becoming more and more of these uh, caterpillars have destroyed uh, large uh, areas of birch wood. Um, I think as much as 10,000 square kilometers have been destroyed until now, making it real tough for reindeer to find uh, food in the forest, mm -hmm. for other animals, as uh, grouse, to find food in the forest, uh, also making an impact on traditional livelihoods. So it sounds like you are already seeing the effects, and, and I mean, it's all an intricate web. Um, if if you if this oil drilling in the Arctic uh, happens or this expanded oil drilling in the Arctic happens, I should say, uh, what further effects could that have on Sapmi or or um, or like the, the the areas that are important, for example, for reindeer herd herding? Mm. Well, I talked a bit about the direct effect of climate change, as I see as a direct effect of further oil drilling. What I think a lot of uh, people in the Sami community are worried about is uh, the more indirect uh, consequences of uh, oil exploration and exploitation in the Barents Sea, mm. uh, the building of infrastructure in um, in Finnmark, uh, where I'm from, at least. Um, people refer to Finnmark and Sápmi as the last wilderness of Europe. But the fact is that people have been there for millennia and used it for millennia. Um, so further building of the of oil in the Barents would probably lead to uh, more power lines, hmm. more big wind farms to supply the fossil uh, fuel uh, oil uh, rigs with clean energy. And all of this are um, taking lands previously used for traditional livelihood and reindeer herding. Um, one windmill or wind farm is not something that might kill an industry like reindeer herding, but the problem comes when there are that many and piece by piece uh, our nature is taken away from us. What kind of reactions have you seen within the Sami community uh, towards the, the court case or within the, the, the youth organization that you are a board member of? Mm. Obviously I can't talk for uh, all the Sami but I've seen pretty, people are pretty supportive of the um, case, as I've seen. Leading Sami politicians and uh, Sami artists uh, have uttered the support for uh, the court case. And I think it's because the Sami people are, like most indigenous peoples, at the forefront of climate change. We are the ones who are experiencing climate change in our lives and directly first. Mm. And we know how much damage climate change could do. Is there, is there, I mean, if we had the Norwegian government with, here, with us here in, in this room right now, 
Uh, what what would you say to them? Like the prime minister. Yeah, for example. <laughs> okay. For example. I'll say hello, good day. <laughs> um, well, speaking of oil and gas, I think it's high time that the Norwegian government uh, takes their climate um, goals seriously and realize that if we are going to uh, stop global warming and do something about Norway's emissions and the emissions of the world. We have to start with the biggest polluters, and the biggest polluter in Norway is the oil industry. Um, we will get nowhere with Norwegian climate policy before we actually do something about the oil industry. And you uh, mentioned the indigenous communi communities, not only in in Norway. Um, what is there anything you would like to say to other indigenous communities? Um, who are affected by climate change and, and trying to take action, for example, against the the oil industry? Mm. Well, I would give my words of encouragement. Uh, as I said, indigenous communities are often at the forefront of climate change as we are living close to nature and living off nature. And I think it's really important that indigenous voices are heard in the climate debate, um, both because we are affected by climate change, but also that indigenous perspectives need to be heard. Uh, so that you don't end up with um, land grabbing to combat CO2 emissions, for instance. Um, making sure that uh, indigenous communities are not overrun when we are building a better future. Well, um, oh, sorry, I think I dropped the, the sound thingy here now. I hope it still still works, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ajlak, for being with us. And let's keep our fingers crossed that this court case goes the way we want it to. Um, we still have 24 hours to add our names to the growing body of evidence against Arctic oil drilling. So please go ahead if you haven't yet done so. And share with as many of your friends as you possibly can. It would be really, really nice if we could reach half a million, um, mainly because it sounds nice. Um, <laughs> tomorrow we'll, we will be live again at 7 o'clock Norwegian time from a cold, dark square somewhere in Oslo. So I hope to see you then again. And thank you so much for being with us. Bye.